thanks for joining us today. Every few weeks, we'll be answering your dental marketing questions and providing ideas on how to generate new patients and make your practice more profitable. I'm Cheryl Petrozzoli, and today I'm joined by Fanny Barrientos. Hello. So today we're going to be talking all about Google and all things Google. So let's get started with the first question. Why do so many people pay attention to Google, but you don't hear much about Bing or Yahoo? So the main reason why is honestly because Google has 85% market share, over 85% depending on where you are. So really Bing and Yahoo have, you know, it's not really worth your time. You'll get some traffic, but uh, it's not really worth it. And their search algorithm works a lot like Google. So if you learn how to optimize your website for Google, you're pretty much covered on Bing and, and Yahoo as well. Okay. Well, and now that you're bringing up algorithms, what does it mean when we hear there's a Google algorithm change? So algorithms are uh, with search algorithms. Obviously, Google tries to figure out and calculate and with like AI, uh, figure out how it wants to rank, you know, the millions and billions of websites out there, right? So an algorithm change is basically a change to that formula that most often changes the way that websites are ranked and the factors that are important for Google. So when we say that there's an algorithm change, it means that the formula has changed a little bit and certain factors may be more or less important depending on what Google decides to do. What are some of the biggest changes that we've had? So lately there's been a few. Um, there's been the biggest one in the last few weeks is mobile first indexing. And what that means is um, traditionally the way that Google would weigh a website is it would look at the desktop version of the website and then go crawl it, understand it, see what's going on, and then determine uh, how to rank it based on that version of the website. Because more and more people are now moving to a mobile first platform, Google is now paying attention to the mobile version of that website. And at this point, most websites are mobile friendly, or they should be, and because that actually became a Google algorithm update back in 2015. So you were most likely forced to move to a mobile first website. So um, yeah, so that, ju that just means that um, your mobile website is gonna be more important. Now, if you have a responsive template on your website, that's not really going to be a big deal uh, because your website design is already responding to the screen size, so the layout changes. Where it may become an issue is if you are still using an adaptive website where the browser recognizes the device and it'll take a different version of your own dental website and then base it off of that. And sometimes you have to edit both versions, the adaptive and the desktop site. So if they differ completely, you know, if they're wildly different, then your rankings may change. Um, was there any other big changes to Google that um, we should know about? Let's see. There was, uh, back in October, there was more of an emphasis on secure websites. So Google definitely prefers listing websites that are SSL. So those are going to be any websites that start with HTTPS. You can tell whether a website is secure because you'll have a warning, especially on a Chrome browser. Um, it'll actually tell you on the top left corner next to the URL whether that website is secure or not. So if your website isn't secure, then you may have seen some updates or some rankings changes back in October of 2017. So what if I want to change the information in my business listing? Maybe my phone number's changed or my address? Yeah, so the best way to do this is by verifying, claiming and verifying your listing. Um, and that can easily be done uh, by going to gybo.com, which is Google's, I guess, like tutorial website that sort of walks you through verifying your listing and then also um, what you need to fill in in order to, you know, optimize it. So, but, um, that's really the best way because then once you claim and verify, then it gives you access to a dashboard where you can go in and make as many changes as you need to. The second way you could do this, if you're for whatever reason locked out of claiming your listing, is you can suggest changes, but those are changes that need to be approved by the Google community. So those can take weeks or months to update. Uh, whereas if you verify it first, it's almost instantaneous. What if for some reason there's multiple listings for my business? So 
that happens a lot, uh, especially with dentists, because there will be, you know, your main dentist in a practice, and there'll be associate dentist, and maybe some specialists that come through, and they practice in multiple places. And so from Google's perspective, um, that's not good, uh, because it doesn't know which listing to offer people if there are multiple ones. It gets confused, and it doesn't want to confuse its own searchers, because that's a bad experience, right? So then it is very likely not going to rank your listing on the Google Maps results. There's a couple of things that you could do to avoid that if you have to have multiple listings, because there are cases where you, from you know, a dentistry perspective, you have to have them, right? If you can uh, avoid them, do, and do so by reporting them and deleting them on your end. Uh, if you have to have them, though, make sure that the name is, is different and just be sure to include the practice name, colon, and then maybe the name of the doctor. And then um, Google Maps will actually have you select a primary category. So a primary category is going to be the main indicator on how Google should be looking at this listing. The primary category for your dental practice should be dental practice or something to that effect. It, you should see it from a pick list. Um, then for every other dentist that you have in your practice, label it as dentist or if they're specialist, orthodontist, periodontist, whatever it is may, they may be. Because then Google will know to distinguish the two, right? Because Google in Google, you're allowed to have a listing for you as the individual doctor. And that's how you tell them. Another signal is by uh, adding your meet the doctors page for that specific doctor onto the doctor's listing. So for your general practice page, just list your general practice website. For the listing that's specific for a doctor, list your specific meet the doctor page. Then include a description that speaks about that doctor specifically. Then finally, if that doctor has different hours, so for example, like my orthodontist is only at my practice on Fridays, right? So he would only list his hours for Fridays. Whereas the general practice listing is going to have Monday through Friday, whatever those hours may be. Finally, on the contact page for your practice, you're going to want to embed the map for the main listing onto the contact page for the overall website. And then the one that's specific to each doctor, you'll want to embed that map into the website page for that specific doctor. And that, that by doing all of those different things, generally, that should help what you'll end up seeing is that it'll start serving up the general practice listing over the doctor ones. What kind of information should you have in your listing? Is so there... you'll want to include everything that I mentioned. Um, if you're juggling multiple listings, then you know, you're going to want to make those uh, differences very uh, prominent on your pages. You should also include the correct business hours for your practice, um, you and you should include a brief description photos of your practice and of your staff and anything like that. Um, you'll also want to make sure that the little um, pin, the little red pin, is in the right location and hovering over the right place on the map because that little pin is what helps guide a GPS. So if it's in, you know, in a random place in a strip mall um, that's not over your office, it's going to guide your patients that direction and then they're going to get get lost within the strip mall. So just make sure that you move that. And again, this is all stuff that can be edited once you've actually claimed and verified your listing within the dashboard. Do you recommend people put pictures in? Pictures of the doctor, pictures of the office? Yeah. Yeah, because then it just kind of gives like a face to the name, you know, it helps people recognize where they're going. Um, I think it's very helpful to have an exterior shot of the office so people know what they're looking for, especially if, you know, if you're in a city like me, you, it's, you can tell where the where it is generally, but it's you having a facade and knowing which door to go through is helpful. So mm -hmm. I think the exterior is really important. And and one morning I just want to share with everybody yeah. when you do have those hours in there, make sure they're accurate. I've actually talked to dentists who've had patients not show up because Google said the office was closed. Yeah. So they're lost <laughs> business. They had to reschedule them. All of that. So it's make it's really important to do that, um, especially because if you're searching for an address using Google Maps on your phone, it's going to tell you this business is closed, this business is closing in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important that, you know, people rely so much on Google. You need to make sure it's got the best information it can. Um, so is there anything else uh, about um, Google that we should really worry about? I guess probably Google Analytics 
understanding Google Analytics, Google Search Console, how those interact is probably a pretty important piece. Google actually offers a lot of products, right, that kind of help you keep track of your web presence. Um, Google Analytics and Google Search Console are two of the more important dashboards to understand what your web presence looks like and how people are behaving once people actually get to your website. So if you can think of like Search Console is kind of your dashboard to understand what's going on in search results around your website. And then Google Analytics helps you understand what's going on within your website, right? So what pages are being visited, how many visitors you're getting, how long they're staying there. Um, with the two, like one covers the exterior, one covers the interior. With the two, you can tell how people are coming in and how they're behaving once they get there. Um, Google won't connect the dots for you completely. You, you do have to make some educated guesses uh, because Google actually won't tell you anymore what keywords people are using to get to specific pages on your website. So um, that has, if you see, if you go through Google Analytics and you see keywords and they're not provided, that's what that is. It's just, it won't disclose that information. But with Search Console, you can more or less tell what keywords are being used to find your website in general. Any, any other important things about using Google or searching that we should know about? Um, so a couple of tips. Um, if you are, if you're going to be dealing with Google, make sure that you have a generic Gmail address that everybody can access. There are ways to add users, users their own personal Gmail address, but it starts getting com pretty confusing. So, um, Think of this Gmail address as your umbrella uh, key to access all of these different products. You can claim your business listing under it. You can open up a search an or an analytics account under it. You can, if you're doing AdWords, you can, you know, drive your AdWords account through it. You can go through Search Console. And by putting all of these products under one login or one key, um, you can connect all of them and that can really give you a little bit more insight into the data that you're gathering rather than having them, you know, act separately. Uh, make sure that you keep that information in a safe place. I am a little more tech savvy, so I tend to just save it in my browser and go to the settings and modify it when, you know, save my password and all that stuff. Um, it's really a convenient way of doing it, but you know, you can be old school and just keep it in a spreadsheet somewhere, put it in your phone, notes, something. Just make sure to keep track of it. And one other thing is uh, I wouldn't recommend just using your personal account, um, your personal Gmail account or your practice account or whatever it may be. Um, just because for a couple of reasons. One, you don't want people digging around in your personal Gmail, right? It's just awkward. <laughs> you don't know what get so many emails and stuff. Um, and then also, um, by only having it on your personal account, if for whatever reason you're, you get locked out of your account, that's it. It's really hard to recover that stuff after you've, you've lost access. So definitely having one master Gmail address is recommended, and then maybe add on your personal uh, account as an additional user to all of those Google products. Yep. Also important if you leave the practice or yeah. if somebody somebody set it up for you and they decide to leave, you you may lose access to it. Um, they don't want to be seeing your information for years and nor do you want them seeing your information for years. Yeah. So, so important. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I like to use when I'm searching on Google, you know, one of my little tips is um, they've got advanced tools where you can actually tighten time frames and things like that when you're searching. And most people completely ignore these, but I find a lot of the times when I'm looking for information, I want something that's current. I always use those tools to tight down the time frame of what I'm getting to a couple of months or just the last year because technology changes so fast if you want to find out what's going on with you know even search changes or new advertising opportunities and things like that um, I, I've had things pull up that are like 10 years old when yeah. I'm searching if I don't really narrow in on those so that's kind of one of my little Google tips one of the things that I was reading about too was if you're trying to find keywords that you can optimize for. I think everybody knows when you start to type it into the search box, you know, Google starts to suggest all kinds of other words to tag on to the end yeah. of it. You know, your, your search phrases that make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get it down, so if it's like, you know, find a dentist in this state or a dentist in my town, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, it shows 
other similar searches that other people use. So if you're looking for some keyword alternatives to use as you're trying to optimize your page, that's another good place to look is what are those alternative phrases that people are searching for to get similar information. Yeah, that's a good one, especially if you're writing blog posts and it's like, I don't want to have to do another in-depth keyword research project, you know, that's fine for the beginning. But if you're just writing a blog post and need some keywords, just type in something and see what other people are saying and then just use those keywords in your blog post. I mean, is there anything else about um, Google people should know about? Yeah, so I know that um, we used to have a, a, this issue where um, people would uh, Google themselves to see where they're ranking. And I think that's something that still happens. And so uh, the problem with that is that um, Google takes into consideration your search history, where you've been clicking around, the types of uh, related search queries that you've been making. And um, and that just really just comes down to Google trying to personalize search results. So I'll give you an example. If you know anyone not in the digital marketing world or an SEO were to search panda, they'd get pictures of cute pandas, right? If I were to search panda because I work in SEO, I'm most likely going to get the panda algorithm update that happened a few years ago. And that's all part of personalization. Um, in order to combat that, and if you want to see where, get an idea of where you're ranking, um, you can go into incognito and do a quick search, but it's still going to take into consideration where you are geographically, so that may still come into play. The best way to tell where you're ranking, again, is by going to Search Console. That's going to give you the most straightforward results. I think that that's a lot of information for today. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us and if you have any questions, please submit those to us. If you go to the website and you go into our podcast area or if you're watching this on our website, there's a, a link below where you can actually click and send in your questions so we can address them on future episodes. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe and share our podcast and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.